Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to this evening's study. Um, at least it's evening here. We're going to continue looking at M. L. Andreasen's letters to the churches. Pick up where we left off last Friday evening. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the Sabbath and for all your blessings and the trials that we experience that give us a dependence upon you. We know, Lord, that uh, this week has been a difficult week for many. There's many things that we face that uh, uh, can wear us out. But we just ask, Lord, that we can be revived by thy spirit, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our minds and strengthen us and encourage us on this Sabbath. We ask for your presence in this study and that uh, you can lead and guide in the things that we discuss. I pray for each person that you can watch over them with your angels care and that you can have each of us uh, be a representative of you. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you remember at last week at the end of the study, we had a, did a little study on Hebrews chapter 11, dealing with uh, they without us would not be made perfect. And, and my view, because I was discussing a little bit about the Lord's goat and the scapegoat, I don't know if you all remember that, uh, a view that I hold that I have never seen anyone express. So maybe it's wrong, but that's what I have believe for a long time and so and if somebody could correct me on it if i'm in error i'd be happy to be corrected but my belief is that the lord's goat represents the completed work of christ in his people so that the lord's goat it does represent christ but it's the completed work of christ that is the work of the 144,000, and that the scapegoat represents of course satan right but also his followers that will also suffer their responsibility for their sins and the sins that they have participated in, in, in the redeemed. Right. And, and some critics of Adventism say, well, you're making Satan to be your savior with him being the scapegoat. Now, of course, it's not unique to Adventism. The idea that the scapegoat refers to Satan, that it used to actually be a fairly common Protestant view. It seems that it's mostly something that has been developed in response to Adventism to show that Adventism is in error in trying to say that the Lord's goat represents, or that, that the scapegoat represents Christ's sacrifice. But if we look at the sanctuary service, we can see it's it's after the sanctuary has been cleansed that the sins that have been cleansed from the sanctuary are then placed upon the head of Satan. And uh, we dealt with a statement in uh, Spalding and McGann collection dealing with that. And um, that's the same vision that Ellen White had on uh, October 23rd, 1850, the one in Early Writings, page 74, that says it's September 23rd. So we, we, we spent time looking at those statements. I wrote a paper on it, which is on my academia site. So what we're going to look at now here is uh, what we mean by blood atonement. And so the idea that Emily Andreasen has here is that, that with Christians who say the atonement is completed at the cross, fail to take into account that that blood in the, in the sanctuary service, in the typical service, has to be applied in some way. And depending on the type of offering, um, but if it's a sin offering, which are offered for sins of ignorance, there is no sin offering in the sanctuary for willful sin because the blood of bulls, bulls and goats cannot take away sin. It's, it's meant to be typical in its understanding in the sanctuary. But So when David committed murder and adultery, was there a sacrifice that he could give when he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had her husband put into battle so that he would be killed? Was there any sacrifice that he could offer in the sanctuary uh, to make up for that sin? No, he said there there wasn't. So thus he, he split, created me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. And so, be in his yeah, heart there, first. Be in his heart. 
Yeah. If there was a sacrifice I could give, I would give it, he says. But yet God accepts the broken and contrite spirit. That's the sacrifice. So we can see that even in the Old Testament, the, the sanctuary was not made, the earthly sanctuary was not made to ultimately deal with sin. It was going to show typically how God is going to deal with sin through the plan of salvation. It's an illustration of the plan of salvation. Now, of course, over time, uh, Jews started to believe that the sanctuary itself, the ceremonies, actually provided salvation. Uh, but we know that they point forward to a work that's done. And so if we're going to accept the sanctuary that and accept what it says in the New Testament, and also if we look at the book of Revelation, uh, this is one of the things I find interesting. I, I, I would often do Bible studies with non-Adventists, evangelicals, different Protestants, Baptists, uh, Pentecostals, Messianic Jews. Uh, I remember doing some studies with some Messianic Jews at the congregation of Bet Mashiach. Um, I think it was like a Wednesday night study or something like that. And, um, you know, they were studying the book of Revelation. And as we started looking at Revelation, I pointed out, you know, all the sanctuary symbolism. And, and, and really oddly, you know, you would think Messianic Jews would be interested in the sanctuary. Well, they're not really Jews. Only The only person who was a Jew there was my friend Ami and, and the pastor. Everybody else was just uh, wannabe Jews, um, you know, wanting to minister to Jews. But anyway, there wasn't really any understanding of the sanctuary. Right? It was like, you know, what are you talking about? Like, Christians just don't know anything about the sanctuary. I know my grandfather, uh, Theodore Reginald Turner, he uh, he died when my dad was 17, I believe. But um, I had his library, and in his library, he had several books dealing with the sanctuary. He seemed to be quite interested in uh, in his collection of old theology books, to have lots dealing with the sanctuary in the Old Testament and, and so forth. And I thought that was rather interesting. Of course, they weren't Adventist books. They were just books dealing with uh, how the sanctuary was laid out and the different offerings and so forth. But but Christians don't know anything about the sanctuary. And so when, you know, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, you know, they, they know there's an animal sacrifice in there somewhere that Christ is that sacrifice. But if you're going to just look at the sacrifice as the only part of salvation— it's quite clear um, that when we look at the Bible, when we look at the sanctuary, that the blood is applied in various ways, right? Sometimes it's poured, poured out at the base of the altar, a burnt offering, some and, and put on the horns of the altar. Some, some of the blood uh, for some of the sacrifices, the sin offerings, is brought into the holy place and, and put up on the altar of, of incense, right? And, and then, of course, we know on the Day of Atonement, the blood that is going to cleanse the sanctuary, which has no sins confessed upon it, the Lord's goat, it's going to be sprinkled, and it's sprinkled to clean the sanctuary, that is, to uh, to remove the sins from the sanctuary. And, and we also have a verse in, um, so sometimes I'll have people say, well, you know, the sanctuary doesn't have any sins in it. Right. You, you've uh, maybe you've run into people like that. Why does the sanctuary in heaven? Why does the sanctuary in heaven need to be cleansed? There's nothing in the Bible about the sanctuary in heaven needing to be cleansed. Um, but in Hebrews nine. It talks about. Um, uh, nine, nine, eleven it starts at Hebrews nine, eleven here. I'll just let you see this on your screen. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. Now, here the King James uses building, but most translations say not of this creation. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, that's uh, the red heifer offering, which you hear lots of people talking about now, that's that's for uh, touching a dead body so that you become ceremonially unclean. And, and they would have this red heifer offering. They would 
take, they would burn it with hyssop and scarlet and um, I can't remember everything. Um, and then they would take these ashes and they could be used. They would mix them with uh, flowing water from, from the, the river. And they would use that to cleanse a person ceremonially from touching a dead person. Right. So that sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. So he's going to mention all these types of things. Um, and then he says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And that that point about the conscience uh, is, is a good study. If somebody wants to look at a study on that, I, I've done it before, but just look up the word conscience in Hebrews. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. Now he's going to some things here about uh, the death of the testator. So he's dealing with uh, a will, basically. And then he says in verse 18, whereupon neither the first covenant was dedicated without blood. That means the first covenant had blood, right? For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the new covenant, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, that is, with these offerings, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So it's a pretty clear statement saying that just as the earthly sanctuary and, and all this had to be purified with these animal sacrifices, the heavenly things, the heavenly sanctuary, has to be purified with better sacrifices. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Right? So... So that's where we're, we're picking up this on, on the blood, the ministration of the blood in the sanctuary. Now, any questions on any of that so far or any comments? I mean, as Seventh-day Adventists, we're quite aware that, you know, there's a heavenly sanctuary and Christ is our high priest and that there's a work that he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary. So and that would be the work of dealing with our sins and what what is happening in heaven represents what's happening on earth. Right. So Christ is our high priest, just as in the earthly type, the people, they themselves do not go into the sanctuary, but they do bring their offering uh, to the door of the tabernacle, right, or to the door of the sanctuary, and they slay it. And um, and the priest catches the blood, and he does all the things with the blood. If it's a sin offering, you know, they've, they put their hands upon the offering, confess their sins, right? There are different types of offerings, not all offerings. There's sin offerings, of course. There's peace offerings and so forth. So in verse 14, Theodore, you said that you did a study on this conscience. What would you call the conscience the mind? Well, it, it, it is a part of the mind. <laughs> um, okay. Right. But, um, you know, it. Yeah. So it, one is in verse nine of Hebrews nine talking about that the earthly sanctuary is a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Right. And um, so, so one thing is, is we see that the earthly sanctuary could not cleanse the conscience, but there has to be a work that's being done in our minds. So the work that Christ is doing in heaven is is not just some, you know, imaginary make-believe thing happening in heaven. It's connected with what God is doing on earth, what Christ is doing on earth in our lives. So, you know, that so is, is doing something to us. What's that? What's that, Felix? 
Sorry. That's uh, what, what I'm getting at, because this is what, what I'm, I'm seeing. And ever since I've been in the faith, the first thing that got me into um, recognizing the war is for your mind. Now, the mind, conscience, I would nearly, I, I would think they were nearly the same thing, because that's yeah, they're a, not. They're it's part of the mind. It's not the whole mind itself. Okay. Right. So yeah, I'm I was very okay. sorry. Because if it was just the mind, they would just use the word the mind. It has to do with the moral consciousness, right? So it has to do with the moral part of the mind. Not every part of our mind is moral. So the conscience has to do with what we normally think of as the conscience. You know, we feel guilt. That's part of our conscience. So it's the 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 moral the moral aspect of our thoughts. But it but it is it is definitely part of the mind right it's not part of our body <laughs> but you you can just you can't just make them equal right they're not exactly equivalent ideas no uh, I'm, I'm it, 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 it talks I'm, about the conscience it is is also yeah because i've done this study before we've done this study several times okay um, so when god's talking to you where how is he talking to you through your conscience through the mind well, well, he, well, he speaks to you through your mind. So when you study the Bible, you know, your intellect, which is part of the mind, that's that's going to be actuated by, you know, language and words. Uh, but the purpose is to reach the conscience. Right. That is why men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. Right. That is people don't want to to have their deeds exposed because of guilt. Right. So. Uh, but you got here in in Hebrews 10, verse 2, uh, for it says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered, talking about if these sins had cleansed us, um, they would need they, they they wouldn't have to constantly be offered, because the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. Right? And um in Hebrews 10, 22, it says, let us draw near with the true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so there they're going to show that that the conscious is part of the hearts, <laughs> the heart. Of course, the Bible has, um, you know, uses the heart, the mind, the soul, the spirit, uh, the conscience. These are just different parts of our internal uh, life, right? So, so obviously, it's not really the heart or really, uh, you know, that does anything as far as feelings are concerned, or or even um, the reins, which are the kidneys. It just has to do with where we feel things. But as far as the conscience is concerned, if 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 you spend some time looking at it, the point is that God wants to cleanse our conscience. That is, we want to have a conscience that's clear. And and the blood of bulls and goats can't do that. It's a work that God wants to do. Well, well let's take a look at um, what Andreasen has to say about this, dealing with the blood atonement. Now, he's going to look at some statements in the spirit of prophecy. And I, I wanted to look at those uh, statements there in, in Hebrews chapter 9 first. Here she says in uh, early writings, page 38, Jesus was clothed with priestly garments. He gazed in pity on the remnant and with a loud voice of deep pity cried, my blood, father, my blood, my blood, my blood. And in Spirit of Prophecy, volume three, page 261, 262, he appears in the presence of God as our great high priest, ready to accept the repentance and to answer the prayers of his people. And through the merits of his own righteousness to present them to the Father. He raises his wounded hands to God and claims their blood bought pardon. I have graven them on the palms of my hands, he pleads. Those memorable wounds of my humiliation and anguish secure to my church the best gifts of omnipotence. Now, one of the things that people often accuse Adventists of is righteousness by works and and that's because we believe that god wants to i mean that 
that the law was not done away at the cross. What was nailed to the cross was the written record of our sins. Our sins were nailed to the cross. In, in a certain sense, I guess you could say the law was nailed to the cross in that its transgression was nailed to the cross. So the sins, which are the transgression of the law, were nailed to the cross. But the law wasn't done away with in that sense, because by the law is the knowledge of sin. If the law was done away, none of us would have any guilt or any sin, right? There would no, be no way that you could actually sin if there was no law, right? So that, that antinomianism, as it's called, it isn't actually that common uh, in Christianity, except if somebody is trying to show that a Seventh-day Adventist is a legalist, right? So you'll hear, hear Christians do lots of sermons about God's law, and we need to keep God's law. But if you bring up the Sabbath, then all of a sudden the law is nailed to the cross. So it's, it's, now some people like Jehovah's Witnesses, they have the law nailed to the cross, and it's taken out of the way, and then they just have Jesus makes new laws in the New Testament that we follow, and, and they say the Sabbath isn't included there, even though in Hebrews it's quite clear that there still remains a keeping of Sabbath to the people of God. So... The Sabbath is not a means of salvation, uh, as we understand it. We understand that it's like we nobody keeps any of the laws to be saved. You cannot, because all of us have sinned, right? So since all of us have sinned, it doesn't matter if if you're if you stop sinning now, it wouldn't change the fact that you've already sinned, right? So so it's, it's kind of a, a silly argument that people bring, but anyway. Uh, the point here that we can see is that it's Christ's righteousness that is presented, not our righteousness, because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, right? So none of us would ever go to God and say, God, you know, you need to accept me because, you know, I'm, I'm good, right? <laughs> That's just not ever happened that I know of. I, I don't know of anybody who's, who's ever had that in their experience. We all see ourselves as sinners, and we know that we need Christ's righteousness. Now, the difference would be some people believe, well, Christ's righteousness will just continue to keep covering our sins so we can just continue sinning. And so the law is not done away, but Christ just, you know, keeps forgiving us. We sin, we repent, we sin, we repent. Uh, and, and so when that's taken to an extreme as well, you see people are just like, well, don't worry about sin. You know, you, you know, you believe in Jesus and you'll be saved, right? Now, we believe, though, that Christ can save us from our sins, not from just from the consequence of sin, but from sin itself, to have a pure heart that's renewed, right? So, and this is all done by Christ and through his sacrifice and through the ministration of his blood, which is him working in our lives, Okay, you had a comment there, somebody? I heard somebody say something. Okay, from Great Controversy 415, the ark that enshrines the tables of the law is covered with the mercy seat before which Christ pleads his blood in the sinner's behalf. So Christ is pleading his blood. Um, from the same book, page 429, when in the typical service, the high priest left the holy place on the day of atonement, he went in before God to present the blood of the sin offering in behalf of all Israel who truly repented of their sins. So Christ had only completed one part of his work as our intercessor to enter upon another portion of the work. And he still pleaded his blood before the father in behalf of all sinners. And, uh, from page 433, Christ is now officiating before the ark of God, leading his blood in behalf of sinners. From Patriarchs and Prophets, page 351, Christ the great high priest, leading his blood before the Father in the sinner's behalf, bears upon his heart the name of every repentant, believing soul. And from Patriarchs and Prophets 357, as Christ at his ascension appeared in the presence of God to plead his blood, in behalf of penitent sin believers, so the priest in the daily ministration sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice in the holy place in the sinner's behalf. And from the same page, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. 
It was to stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. And with all these statements before him, not once does the author of Questions on Doctrine mention the blood that's being applied or ministered. So, so we can see here this dealing with the book Questions on Doctrine. They seem to leave out all of these statements. So the idea that, that there comes a time when the record of sin, that is when sins are really canceled, they're blotted out, is, is seen in the Day of Atonement, which is typical of the end of the world. So what does it mean that sins are blotted out or that they're canceled? This comes back to First John 1, 9, isn't it? Um, Theodore, the same as actually you mentioned before about um, David with Bathsheba and Uriah. Basically, if he confessed his sins, basically he... And from his heart, which we see he did, basically they're forgiven. Yeah, so if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And now, Jesus said, and go and sin no more. Yeah, so so we have this issue, which which is unique to Adventism, as far as I know. I don't know of any other church that really addresses the heavenly sanctuary and the day of atonement and the final blotting out of sins at the end of the world. But it's what we believe. We believe that um, that there is a work that has to be accomplished before Christ can return. So the idea is in the spring types, Christ comes in the spring. He comes as the Passover lamb. Uh, he fulfills the spring types. And then he ascends up to heaven and he's our high priest. And then he's going to uh, fulfill the fall types at the end of the world. Right. So on October 22nd, 1844, we believe that Christ began that work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, what we believe is that, that there is a work that happens at the end of the world. That is, it's not something that God arbitrarily does. That is, could Jesus have begun the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary of the Day of Atonement unless that message was announced prior to it occurring, if you understood my sentence? Why can the Day of Atonement not just happen without it being announced? Are you talking about Amos 3.7? The Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets for his servant, the prophets? Well, I wasn't thinking of that one. I'm thinking of the book of Revelation itself. Okay. So so we know in the in, in the fall types you're gonna have Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, and that begins the Feast of Trumpets. What is the Feast of Trumpets announcing? What why do they have a Feast of Trumpets? To prepare the people for convocation. Okay, so the Feast of Trumpets is announcing that there's gonna be this day of atonement, right? And and we can see that in um Revelation chapter eight. You're, you're in the book of Revelation. You're going to see all of these sanctuary symbolism. You're going to see the golden candlesticks. You're going to see the table of showbread. You're going to see the laver. You're going to see the altar of uh, burnt offering, uh, the altar of sacrifice. You're going to see the altar of incense. You're going to see the Ark of the Covenant. Every, every article of furniture in the sanctuary, not just in the sanctuary itself, but involved in the service, is going to be illustrated in the book of Revelation. And... Uh, there's going to be these seven uh, trumpets, right? And these trumpets are events historically that end up preceding the Day of Atonement, right? That is, they start in the past. Um, you know, we don't have time to do a whole study on. But these, these are first, you're going to have the first uh, four trumpets. They're going to be judgments against Western Rome, right? And then the the fifth and sixth trumpet are going to be ju tr judgments against Eastern Rome. Okay, so you're going to have the, the fifth and sixth trumpets. And then in uh, chapter 10, you're going to have this parenthetical chapter, we could call it, where you're going to have the seven thunders. So it's going to, you're going to see the book of Daniel unsealed, this little book open, that was sealed with seven seals in, in chapter four and five, particularly in chapter five, right? You have this book, but it's the same vision. Chapter four and five is the same, same story. 
And this is going to parallel Daniel chapter 12. And then, and then you're going to see these two witnesses. This is going to be like the French Revolution. And then you're going to have, and then you're going to have the seventh trumpet, right? It's going to say the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe coming quickly. And then you're going to have the seventh trumpet. And uh, we believe that that trumpet began to sound October 22nd, 1844. And the seventh angel sounded and there was great voices in the heaven saying, the, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and 20 elders that we saw in chapter four, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshiped God saying, we give thanks, O Lord, God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, right? So the judgment of the dead, right? That's going to be October 22nd, 1844. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants and the prophets and to the saints, and them that fear thy name small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. That's the ten, where we have the testament or the covenant, which is has the Ten Commandments. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So this is re referring to the past, right? This is something that happened in October 22nd, 1844. And, and we see that now. I mean, we know, of course, Hiram Edson saw this scene where the temple of God was opened in heaven, right? And he sees Christ moving from the holy to the most holy. But Adventists didn't know about his vision generally until 1905. So even though it was in 1844, October 23rd, he had that vision. Okay, so I say all this because we can see that there is this work that has to be done. And, and that's the whole, the whole point, I guess, of, of Adventism. If we're going to look at Adventism and see what's unique about it, it is about the Day of Atonement. So when our leaders in the 50s basically didn't even address this point when they dealt with the evangelicals, what does that say about what, why, why was that? Did, did they not know? Had they forgotten? Did they not believe these things? How do we explain it? How could, how could a Seventh-day Adventist minister, especially a leader in the church, be unaware of these things that the common Adventist would know about, or especially in the 1950s? Or did people not know about these things? Did we somehow not understand our own teachings? Something to think about. Isn't it the same today, Theodore? How many times, and I think I've mentioned this before, how many times do we hear anything about the sanctuary and Adventism at the moment? I remember oh, 10 years, 20 years ago now, I'd, I'd never heard, when I ended up doing a sermon myself, did a drawing and explained it because basically I'd never heard anyone talk on sanctuary. And I saw the importance of it. Okay, well, I've been an Adventist now for 40, you know, I'm, Aaron, it'll be 42 years on Christmas. And I've never heard a minister preach a sermon on the sanctuary. I've only ever heard lay people preach on it. Why, why is that, Theodore? I don't know. I, it, I've it, always it, wondered about it. It's one of the foundations of Adventism. They said, I know when, when I've ever mentioned it to especially other congregations, they don't want to know about it. But, you know, it, it, what you said earlier on, behold the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. It, uh... Well, I, I think, you know, because I know within Adventism, uh, especially generational Adventists, they have quite a distorted view of of this work. So one of the things is, they have a caricature of the work of Christ as, as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, right? And we saw that even with E.J. Wagner. So E.J. Wagner, of course, who brought the message of righteousness by faith in 1888, when he wrote his, his confession of faith, the last thing he wrote before he died, you know, he repeated, he rejected uh, the idea that Christ is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary ministering our blood. 
He says, wouldn't the blood be dry? Now, if you think about it, what, what's the problem with his, his thinking? Is he taking it too literally? Because <laughs> is Jesus That's actually the, his blood? I'll take a spiritual application. <laughs> yeah, Jesus doesn't have some of his blood. He's not sprinkling his blood literally in heaven. Right? Yeah, he's pretty distorted. <laughs> Yeah, so so we know that we're just we're, when we're talking that way, we're talking in symbolic language. We're using the language of the type to explain what Christ is doing. That is, the type pointed to the work that Christ is doing now. That is, the priest had to minister blood. Christ is ministering for us through the merits of what He accomplished at the cross. That He's the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So, I mean, He's always been our savior he didn't like you know when he came and he died for our sins he just demonstrated the love that he always had for us right it's not and and he's not changing the father's mind toward us either but we get this picture this idea this sort of caricature of within adventism of this sort of this mean angry god the father and this meek and loving uh jesus the son and and he has to go and appease the father uh, by, you know, offering his blood, saying, look, I died for them. You have to accept them. I mean, in a sense, that illustration is it, it's illustrating a work that has to be done because are we separated from God because of our sins? Does the law of God demand justice? Yes. Right. So so it's illustrated. In Christ, pleading before the Father, his merits on behalf of us. But the Father and the Son, they both love us just as much, right? It's Jesus is just revealing the love of the Father, right? This is, this is something, so, see, you know, ever since I've been yeah. in the church, I've realized we basically have to keep focused. If we if we keep focusing on the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, we're basically not going to have a problem. It's basically when when mankind gets in the way and starts want, wanting to be the greatest or wanting to uh, do things that we have problems. I, I used to stand at the church at uh, Werribee and actually st uh, stand at the guy. I remember people used to comment, why would you, the elder, be at the ch door? I said, because I want people to look to Christ, not to the other people in the church. <laughs> Yeah. Um, that's our downfall, and it's right through the the the, the Bible. You know, the apostles were. Okay. Well, well, look at it this way. So, the Jews at the time of Christ, what was their problem in understanding of the work that Christ was going to come to do? Did they understand the work of the sanctuary when Christ came? It, 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 they, in a sense, had a caricature of the earthly sanctuary, right? What was being accomplished? They thought the blood of bulls and goats was taking away their sin. Correct? Yeah, the, you're right. Yeah. So we're no different today than were the Jews in the time of Christ. They weren't able to appreciate the work that he was doing because it had been misrepresented to them. And, and the same has happened within Adventism and within Christianity. It, it's, 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 it's been distorted. And there's no reason for it, really. I mean, I've never been able to see it, you know, how, how you know, generational Adventists would look at God and the Bible and spirit of prophecy and, and the kinds of attitudes they would have about it. And I would think, well, maybe it's because, you know, when they were raised, their parents didn't really understand things. And maybe a lot of unconverted people influenced them. And, and you know, and when you teach stories to children, children sometimes you know, they take them very literalistically, and maybe as they get older, they never really look at them spiritually. They just kind of take them as on that sort of simplistic way that they did as children. But but I don't see how that could be, really. There has to be something more to it than that. You know, it, it really must be a spiritual issue. It can't just be an intellectual issue. So, so I mean, it's something that, you know, I... I wish I knew, the, you know, the answer, how to explain to people uh, the truth. But some people don't. It's like they don't want to see it. It's like they want the excuse to reject Adventism so that they can do what they want. That's what I think it is. They just want their own way. And so by uh, 
making it a caricature, it allows them to dismiss it. So they don't have to actually deal with the reality of it. Okay, we go on here. Andreasen says, in working out this righteous character, Christ demonstrated that it could be done. But could others do the same? That needed to be demonstrated also. Christ had guaranteed it could. It was now for Christ to make good his pledge. Now this here, this point that he's bringing out, this is what presently the leadership of the Adventist church sees as error. That is, they call it last generation theology. And I've had uh, two friends of mine, one who's a treasurer and the other one who's a uh, a pastor in Alberta conference um, say that this is this last generation theology is this danger to Adventism, something they used to believe. And this is the idea that God needs the final de generation to demonstrate this work that Christ had accomplished at the cross, that it needs to be accomplished in his people. That's really what this pleading of the blood is. It's a work that Christ is doing in us right now. Character is not created. It is made, it is developed, it is built uh, through manifold tests and temptations and trials. God at first gives a light test and a little stronger and still a little stronger. Little by little, resistance to temptations grows stronger. And after a while, certain temptations cease to be temptations. A man may have a great st struggle with tobacco, but at last he is victorious and his victory may be so complete that tobacco is a temptation no longer. Now, I'm going to have some issue with him here. And, and I'm not saying that I disagree with him. But I think that we need to look at character as more than dealing with just temptations. Right? Because when we deal with sin, I mean, sin is a symptom of a disease. Right. Right. People can people can overcome certain habits. Now, some habits are more difficult to overcome and some people have more willpower, but they can overcome habits and habits can change uh, by repetition. So somebody who who stops smoking tobacco over time, he, he may not have any uh, temptation to smoke again. But it doesn't mean that he has developed a Christ-like character, right? It's not just about stopping sinning. It's about what? What is character about? Can I read you from um, education about the greatest wonder and want of men, basically? But uh, what she says there is, but such a character is not <clears throat> the result of an accident. It is not due to any special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self to the service of love to God and man. Education, page 57. And so we can see that this is a part of it. So overcoming temptations is a part of developing character, right? So we're not going to disagree with that part of it. Amen. But it's, it's not just about overcoming sins. It's about having a transformation of our minds. This is the right. matter of our walk with God, Theodore. This is actually, this is the Enoch situation that I see anyhow. I, I see, and I know Ellen White talks about the last days, we need to be like Enoch. We need to have this walk with God from, from the time we become a Christian to realize we have a God who will walk with us. Yeah. See, there is a battle with self that needs to be fought, right? And, and sometimes we go into this battle to try to overcome particular sins, and I'm not saying it's wrong to try to overcome particular sins. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that, that is the battleground begins before that. It begins in our prayer life, in our study, the things that we think about, the things we contemplate. Because otherwise, we're not going to be able to resist those temptations. Right? What, we sin, just, what sin should we, we have a problem with, Theodore? What, what's I, that? As Christians, you know, we, we should have actually put our sins behind us. That is, that the 144,000 that follow the Lamb wheresoever he's go are not hanging on to a sin of any sort. They should right. have all well, been. Yeah. 
But but what I'm saying is we look at our lives, we see sins, and we start to we're, sins are a symptom of something. It's like dealing with this with this the symptoms of an illness, but not dealing with the root of the illness itself. Right. And we there are people who can fool themselves because they can overcome certain types of sins. They can stop doing certain things. Right. So I know people, you know, they can they can eat a, a strict diet. Uh, they can be really diligent about Sabbath keeping and and all kinds of things. But they're gossips or they're critical of others or they look down on others or they, you know, they have a lot of anger still. Right. And so just because they they overcame some particular habits, they think that they that they're better than other people. And so they haven't really developed any character at all. Right. That, that That's the only point that I'm trying to make here. So obviously, I believe in overcoming sins. But to have a transformation of character means that we're going to love like God loved. We're going to forgive like Jesus forgave. We're going to consider others better than ourselves. Right. We're not going to be self is not going to be part of the issue. So I know many people, they live a pretty clean, righteous life as the Pharisees did, but uh, they're backbiters. You know, they they think they're righteous. They think they're better than other people. And this has been a problem within Adventism that has put a contempt upon what we would call conservative Adventism. People who are, you know, talk about a lot of the things we talk about, but yet demonstrate an unchristlike in character, an Christ-likeness in character. And we saw this in the movement itself. We saw people who all they were concerned about was their own position within the movement. They, they didn't show any love or sympathy or forgiveness or kindness or gentleness or meekness, right? Um, they were boasters, you know, proud and and lovers of pleasure, really more than lovers of God. We, we saw all of this, right? And we also have seen it in ourselves, right? So it's not just seeing it in other people. We can all see this in ourselves, that we aren't truly converted. And so, so what, it's just when I think about character, I don't think about like overcoming tobacco as, as the starting point, but I think that many Adventists will think about those things as the starting point. Now, maybe for some individuals, that's where they have to start, right? There is a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy, five testimonies on the message to the Laodiceans talking about Christ knocking on the door of our heart and that we have to remove the rubbish so that he can open the door. There are things that hinder our relationship with God that we can deal with. We can't, and when he, we open the door to Christ, he comes in and cleans up the mess. But we at least need to get the rubbish from the front of the door. That's the illustration. I really like that illustration. Because what we need is Christ to come in. We need to have that communion with him so that, so that we can be changed from the inside out. But many of us are just whited sepulchers or, or dishes that are clean on the outside. Right? So, so you, you hopefully you see my point. I'm not trying to argue with him here on this point, um, but I do think that often this is, for some people, it never goes above trying to get rid of particular sins, and character is a lot more than that. Thus, ideally, it should be with every temptation. Holiness is not attained in a day. Redemption, redemption is that process by which the soul is trained for heaven. Desire of Ages, page 330. A man may gain victories every day, but still may not have attained. Even Paul had to admit that he had not already attained, either were already perfect. But undaunted, he exclaims, I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Jesus Christ. Now we know, even if somebody reflects Christ's character, he would be the last person to recognize this. Because our our responsibility is to see ourselves as sinners, not to see ourselves as righteous. We look to Christ for righteousness only. Christ had pledged to make a man finer than gold, even the golden wedge of Ophir. In this work, man must not be a submissive instrument only. He must take an active part. Now, 
Now, this is another important point. So um, we saw back in uh, the 1980s with uh, Morris Venden, who who took the position that it's, you know, we just kind of allow Christ's righteousness. We don't really take an active part. So somehow, you know, Christ is just going to take over our lives and, and we'll be righteous just because without without any effort, right? In his book, To Know God, A Five-Day Plan, he made that really clear. And of course, that's not true. Effort has to happen in order to develop a Christ-like character. I, I sort of liken it to, um, you know, if you're going to get in physical shape, there's lots of these uh, plans, you know, where you can eat everything, you eat as much as you want, never gain weight, or you can, you know, build muscle on, uh, you know, do this thing for 10 minutes a day. Is that realistic? Any of those types of things. It's all a scam. Yeah. You know, I, I'm in good shape now. I wasn't a year ago. And that's three to four hours a day of exercise. You know, that's, that's all there is to it. Right. Does it take effort to get in shape? It does. Right. There's no sort of passive or, uh, you know, I can't just get in shape by, you know, praying to God and saying, God, can you, you know, give me a nice physique and, you know, uh, good cardio. And uh, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm too busy right now to do any exercise. Can you just do that for me? And that's not how it works. Right. So same in the Christian life. There is a struggle. You have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. And, and so we need to recognize this struggle. But, but the struggle is to address the root causes in our lives. Why do we do what we do? Why do I like sin? And, you know, you see in uh, what Kelly's gone through with the program, uh, even though the program is not a Christian program, it's based upon a Christian idea, 12 steps. There is no way to overcome uh, addictions passively there's not like some magic bullet that just all of a sudden if you just know this one thing you know you'll never be addicted to anything ever again right there is a struggle with self that goes on and you do need god we can't do this on our own with with the 12 steps i like to keep it really simple for the first three steps mm -hmm. it's uh step one two three i can't God can, I'll let him. Yeah. Now, sometimes the letting him is the hard part because, of course, we love, you know, the sin that we do. And sometimes we don't love ourselves enough, right? Because we don't care. Right? And the, the letting him is a process through the next. Uh, yes. There's 12, nine steps. So, yeah. you know, step four, we take a searching and fearless moral inventory. Mm -hmm. And and then step five is to admit to God, ourselves, and another human being, the nature of our wrongs, not our specific sins, not like it committing our, you know, yeah. going to confession to a priest. It's just saying, you know, we're a thief, we're this and that. And on and on and on. And, and so that process until step 12, we're having, having had a spiritual awakening. We share it with others. Yeah. Yeah. I'm having that spiritual awakening. It's more than I've had since I became an Adventist. Well, at the beginning of being a Christian, I really did have a spiritual awakening. It was so, yeah. I was so close. And now it's like, now it's closer than yeah. I've ever been. Yeah, and I crushed. think, you know, and, and I think about this, like, you know, I mean, all of us, maybe I can't include everyone, but I know myself losing my first love, right? So there is this first time that you come to know God, you give your life over to him and he starts to work in amazing ways. And, but somehow, you know, that, that experience 
fades. And it, and it could be just, you know, decisions we've made in our lives, uh, circumstances that, that have come along and we've, we've made choices, you know, not to really follow God. And, and, and God would be speaking to us and then that voice starts to fade. And, and then we wake up one day and we realize we're far from God and we're not where we want to be. And, and I remember for me where that was, where I realized the shape I was in. And I wrote a song, which was a prayer to God, you know, asking him basically to destroy my life and to rebuild it. I realized I couldn't, I couldn't from where I was, it couldn't just be rebuilt. It had to be destroyed. And, you know, that was the end of my marriage and, and all those things that were extremely painful. But I recognized that that had to happen. There wasn't, there could be no patchwork at that point. Um, I couldn't just patch it together. And, and so God's, you know, began there this work of rebuilding what he tore down. And, you know, it's, but it's, it's still a work that's in progress, right? So you, ma you mentioned something there, Theodore. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we become Laodicean, lukewarm in our experience. Uh, I'm thinking probably back to 2010, there was another Revelation seminar coming up. The church was holding, you know, and these are fine and good. But I, I said to myself that I could, I could teach this with my eyes closed sort of thing. I, I knew them off by heart. And I asked myself, I, is there anything more? Like, there must be more. And I wasn't finding it. And then I came upon, you know, the, the movement and the 2520. And then I went to sleep for a little while while Theodore, <laughs> Peter was bringing all this pile of books over and showing me things about 2520 and so on. And then I woke up when you called me and asked me if I knew anything about it, because you had heard Wayne Lemon at your church. Wayne and Lemon. I said, well, I said, well, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> um, and I'm like, okay, well, if Theodore is interested in it and Peter's trying to teach me about it, it must be something that must be maybe the something I'm looking for. It brought new, new light and yeah. life and experience. And, and from that point forward, I, I still coasted quite a bit. Um, but uh, uh, and you had some real major difficulties over the last yeah. couple. Of years. Um, but it, yeah, and but, the, but it's the still part of years now. But it's still that a part of me. It's up happening, you know, that God, that as we come face to face with truth, it actually undoes things. Like it, our lives do fall apart. You know, it's not as simply that truth comes and we just accept it and everything's wonderful. Like there is a battle that goes on. Every time light comes to us. Yeah, with with the caveat or exception that at the beginning of our Christian experience, it is like a feathered nest. I like to use the experience of the mother eagle, you know, that the, the eaglets are in the feathered nest. They're warm and comfortable, and then she brings food to them and feeds them just like Christ does. Yeah. And then as we as we grow, as they grow, you know, they got to get out of the nest and learn to fly. So she starts bringing back brambles making it uncomfortable to get out of the nest and onto the edge of the nest where they're looking for for mom and she dives at them so that they fall off the nest and they're they're flailing in the air and she catches them on her back and brings them up and teaches them over and over just like god brings us over the grounds over and over until we learn and so at the beginning of our christian experience yeah it's it's a really warm beautiful thing and and then life. Yeah. Well, um, you, you know who um, uh, Phil Kagey is. Uh, you're talking about the singer? Yeah, the singer Phil Kagey. Yeah. And I remember his first album uh, was, was, it was called What a Day, something like that. It's a really, really positive album, you know, because he was just a new Christian and everything was just wonderful. And then his second album was a lot darker. <laughs> You know, because Christian experience came in, right? It and 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 it's just so common for for us to have that 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 experience that's just so wonderful at first, and then then the reality of life comes along because there is so much in us that is unlike Christ that we're unaware of. 
Amen. Yeah, so it's tough. I, I always feel for somebody who becomes a Christian um, because I know that they're going to be facing some very difficult times. And yet I'm thankful that they are because those difficult times are because of this conflict between our nature and God's nature. And so it's, uh, it's just part of the Christian life. Okay, so God is going to make us find every goal. He promises this to us, right? He's going to do this work in us that he begun. He's going to complete it, right? We, we know that. The ransom of the human race was appointed to give man another trial. It was manuscript 14, 1898. The plan of salvation was designed to redeem the fallen race to give man another trial. That's from Signs of the Times, April 26, 1899. God looked upon the victim expiring on the cross and said, it is finished. The human race shall have another trial. Use instructor, June 21, 1900. That the transgressor might have another trial, the eternal son of God interposed himself to bear the punishment of transgression. That review and Herald, February 8th, 1898. He suffered in our stead that men could have another test in trial. Uh, so that's special instruction relating to the Herald office, page 28. As Jesus was accepted as our substitute and surety, every one of us will be accepted if we stand the test and trial for ourselves. Review and Herald, June 10, 1890. The Savior overcame to show man how he may overcome. Man must work with his human power, aided by the divine power of Christ, to resist and conquer at any cost to himself. In short, he must overcome as Christ overcame. Man must do his part. He must be victor on his own account through the strength and grace that man, that Christ gives him. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, right? It's humanity and divinity combined. Humanity and divinity combined does not commit sin, right? So it's, God has to have our cooperation. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Right? We, we can never take away our part. But many Christians want Christ to do it all. Now, Christ can do it all through us if we allow him to. If we cooperate with him. But he can't do it all without us. And so, you know, to to yoke up with Christ, that is the great joy of the Christian life, to cooperate with him. Christ had pledged to make men overcomers. He had guaranteed this. It was no easy task, but the work of atonement was not finished until and unless he did it. And so Christ persevered till his task should be done. Out of the last generation, out of the weakest of the weak, Christ selects a group with which to make the demonstration that man can overcome as Christ overcame. In the 144,000, Christ will stand justified and glorified. They prove that it is possible for man to live a life pleasing to God under all conditions and that men can stand, can at last stand in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Great Controversy 614. The testimony is given them that they have stood without an intercessor through the final outpouring of God's judgments. Great Controversy 649. They are the chosen ones joined to heirs with Christ in the great firm of heaven. They overcame as he overcame. Manuscript, November 28, 1897. To us comes the invitation. Now, while our high priest is making atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Um, Great Controversy 623. So Kelly has a quote there. Uh, so that's from, that's, uh, it's Corinthians. Second Corinthians 4, four, four. 6 to yeah. yeah. Okay. Second, that's what I say. I couldn't remember if it was first or second Corinthians, but yeah, second Corinthians 4. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 
We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. One of my favorite scripture songs, right? Yeah. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge. I'm not saying it right. I'll get it. Something For like that. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of That's the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not <clears throat> and not of us second Corinthians four six and seven <laughs> yeah yeah I remember Encong taught me that one um you know, remember Valerie and Ancon? Anyway, yeah. yeah. Good old days in the upper room. Scripture songs that says the scripture at the end of the scripture song. <laughs> the first scripture song I wrote did that, but I didn't afterwards. Okay. In his epistle to the Ephesians, Paul presents us with a mystery. It says he, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Marriage fitly represents the union between Christ and the church, affected by the atonement. In harmony with this picture of a marriage, the public announcement is made at the close of probation. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted that she should be arrayed in linen, clean and white, for the linen is the righteousness of the saints. Revelation 19.8. As husband and wife are one, so now are Christ and the church. The atonement, the true atonement, the final atonement, the complete atonement has been made. The family of heaven and the family of earth are one. Desire of Ages, page 835 of that last little bit. <clears throat> now, of course, the 144,000 is often misunderstood, uh, even within Adventism. And uh, we know that that is th those that are alive when Christ returns, um, not all of the saved. It's not, and they're not some like Jehovah's Witnesses have them, you know, picked throughout, you know, all history. You know, once, you know, they get a certain number. Um, because we know that these are not people who are resurrected. These are people who are alive when Christ returns. They're not resurrected people. Um, practically all Adventists have read the last few chapters in Great Controversy, which describe the fearful struggle through which God's people will pass before the end. As Christ was tried to the utmost in the temptation in the wilderness and in the Garden of Gethsemane, so the 144,000 will likewise be tried. They apparently they will apparently be left to perish as their prayers remain unanswered, as were Christ's in Gethsemane when his petitions were denied. But their faith will not fail. With Job they exclaim, though he slay me, yet will I trust him, Job 13.15. The final demonstration of what God can do in humanity is made in the last generation who bears all the infirmities and weaknesses which the race has acquired through 6,000 years of sin and transgression. In the words of Sister White, they bore the results of the working of the great law of heredity. She says that in Desire of Ages 48. The weakest of mankind 
are to be subjected to the strongest of Satan's temptations, that the power of God might be abundantly shown. It was an hour of fearful, terrible agony to the saints. Day and night they cried unto God for deliverance. To outward appearance, there was no possibility of their escape. Early Writings 283. According to the new theology, which our leaders have accepted and are now teaching, the 144,000 will be subjected to a temptation immeasurably stronger than any Christ ever experienced. For while the last generation will bear the weaknesses and passions of their forefathers, they claim that Christ was exempt from all these. Christ, we are told, did not inherit any of the passions that corrupt the natural descendants of Adam. And that's from Questions on Doctrine uh, 383. So they say, right? And he was therefore functioning on a higher and altogether different level from men who have to battle with inherited passions, and hence he does not know and has not experienced the real power of sin. But this is not the kind of savior I need. I need one who has been tempted all in all points like as we are. The substitute Christ, which our leaders present to us, I must reject and do reject. Thank God. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now, of course, we, we've discussed this quite a bit, you know, the nature of Christ. And so, and, and I've told this story many times, you know, raised in the United Church of Canada. Um, and it, my, my understanding of God came from Uncle Arthur's bedtime storybooks, the few stories about Jesus in those bedtime storybooks. And that was the God, that was the Jesus that I knew. And the Jesus I knew could identify with me. So I had an idea of Jesus that was not this, you know, God is watching us from a distance type of God. I felt that Jesus was very near as a child. And that he understood everything that I was going through. He wasn't distant. He wasn't, you know, just this God way off there who I couldn't approach. And and I, and I believe that I received that from from that Adventist literature that my dad bought in Saskatchewan. So you know, and as I said, when I was an Adventist, after I read Desire of Ages and while reading Desire of Ages, I realized for the first time that those were Adventist books. That, that my mom had read to me. Of course, that was extremely powerful emotionally to recognize that. And, but I also recognize that many people who are Christians have no true conception of God. That is, they don't know Christ. They can talk a lot about Christ, but the Christ that they have is, is more the commercial Christ. You know, the one they see in the movies and on TV. Um, it's not the real Christ. And it's hard to explain that to people, that, that they don't know Christ. So, yeah. Anyway, it's just something that, that, that always has just been, you know, how do I reveal Christ to people? Because, you know, if, if, if I know Christ, I can reveal him. If he's in me, other people can see Christ. <clears throat> so an indictment against God. Uh, but more than even this is involved in the new theology. It places an indictment against God as the author of a scheme to deceive both men and Satan. Here's the situation. Satan has consistently maintained that God is unjust in requiring men to obey his law, which he claims is impossible. And God has maintained that it can be done and to substantiate his claim offered to send his son to this world to prove his contention. The son did come and kept the law and challenged men to convince him of sin. He was found to be sinless, holy, and without blame. He proved that the law could be kept, and God stood vindicated. And his requirement that men keep his commandments was found to be just. God had won, and Satan was defeated. But there was a hitch in this, for Satan claimed that God had not played fair. He had favored his son. He had exempted him from the results of the working of the great law of heredity, to which all other men were subject. He had exempted Christ from the inherited passions and pollutions that corrupted the natural descendants of Adam. Questions on Doctrine 383. He had not exempted mankind in general, but Christ only. And that, of course, invalidated Christ's work on earth. 
He was no longer one of us who had demonstrated the power of God to keep men from sinning. He was a deceiver whom God had given preferred treatment and was not afflicted with inherited passions as men are. Satan had little difficulty in having men accept this view. The Catholic Church accepted it in due time. The evangelicals gave their consent. And in 1956, the leaders of the Adventist Church also adopted this view. It was the matter of exemption that caused Peter to take Christ aside and say, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee, which so raised the wrath of Christ that he told Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Matthew 16, 22 and 23. Christ did not want to be exempt. He told Peter, thou savorest not the things that be of God. So some today savor, savor not the things of God. They think it merely a matter of semantics. God pity such and open their eyes to the things that be of God. With the surrender of the Adventist leaders to the monstrous doctrine of an exempt Christ, Satan's last, last opposition was, has surrendered. We pray again, may God save his people. I've been asked what I expect to accomplish. I am not out to win any argument. I am a Seventh-day Adventist minister whose work is to preach the truth and combat error. The Bible is mostly a record of the protest of God's witnesses against the prevailing sins of the church and also of their apparent failure. Practically all protesters sealed their testimony with their blood and the church went on until God intervened. All Paul hoped was that he might save some 1 Corinthians 9.22. Practically all the apostles died martyrs, and in Christ they hanged on a tree. It took 40 years before the destruction came, but when God intervened, he did thorough work. This denomination needs to go back to the instruction given in 1888, which was scorned. We need a reform in organization that will not permit a few men to direct every move made anywhere in the world. And we need a reform that will not permit a few men to handle finances, as is now being done. We need a reform that will not permit men to spend millions on institutions not authorized by the vote of the constituency, while mission fields are suffering for want of the barest necessities. We need a change on the emphasis that is given to promotion, finances, and statistics. We need to restore the Sabbath school to its rightful place in the work of God. We need to put a stop to the entertainments and suppers that are creeping in under the guise of raising money for good purposes. And we need to put a stop to the weekly announcements in church that are merely disguised advertisements. This list could be greatly enlarged. But all these, while important, are after all only minor things. We need a reformation and revival, most of all. If our leaders will not lead in this, then there shall, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, Esther 4.14. I am of good cheer praying for the peace of Israel. Okay, so now this is the end of this study. So we've done this uh, study now. Uh, what number is this, Iran? 115? I think it's 114. 114? Okay. So we've done, studied the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And, and I think this is a good place to stop on this study. I'm not sure what we're going to study next week. Um, we need some prayer in that regard uh, for our Friday night studies. But we've covered a lot of ground. I found, this... the, uh, I found the 1888 sermons by Ellen White to be like just full of full of good good stuff. And the other one I found is a, a notebook notebook leaflets. Leaflets, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but yeah. Anyway, yeah. Well, uh, which would be along the same sort of vein of what we're studying, but but I I haven't really thought about it yet. What we should do, as far as you know, for our Friday night studies. So I'm going to give it some thought and prayer, and you guys can as well. I mean, I know we like to have more a, you know, because our, our morning studies are pretty technical kind of digging into the scriptures. Uh, the Sabbath studies right now, I mean, I could move um, that reading also to Friday night as well as Sabbath morning, but I don't know if I want to do that. Um, if I could refer it as, uh, I, th I find the Friday evening studies uh, more relational, like our mm -hmm. relationship to uh, 
I pre like Friday nights are my favorite. I gotta say, yeah, uh, they're they're the cap on the week for me and the start of the Sabbath. Yeah, right focus. Yeah, they're always a blessing for me as well. But even when we were studying other topics, I always liked the Friday night ones the most. But not sure why. Maybe it's just because it's the start of the Sabbath, and uh, and we tend to have a bit more discussion. But anyway, um, any, any final thoughts on this whole series? I mean, we covered a lot of ground. I, I believe people have been blessed in having a greater understanding of the issues of righteousness by faith within Adventism. The second last paragraph speaks to what we were discussing a couple mornings ago, I think, about tithe. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the whole the whole issue is that, um, you know, God is taking the work into his own hands. We, we were looking in the morning studies dealing with uh, uh, a parallel between uh, that time when uh, uh, Samuel uh, begins his work. And, you know, after the the ark uh, has been captured by the Philistines and there's. You know, so the work is sort of scattered. We're saying that there's a parallel there uh, to our time, that the, the ark has been taken. And we compare the Ten Commandments there to the two tables, uh, the 1843 and 1850 charts, the foundation of this, this message of Adventism, which contain in types and symbols basically the whole everlasting gospel. So one thing I think I would like to go through on Friday nights uh, before we close with prayer here, uh, just mention to think about this. Um, I would like to go through uh, some Millerite history again. And uh, we did some of that when we went through uh, this Three Angels Messages. We went through some Ellen White illustrations, the Three Angels Messages illustrated. But there's just a lot of history there that... Uh, could be very very useful as well, but I gotta I gotta pray about it. And somebody may be impressed to even lead out, but let's let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we have had here this evening. And Lord, we we have had battles this week. We know, Lord, that that Satan is angry, and uh, and we are sinners. And we are selfish. We have not done what you have asked us to do. We just give our hearts to you, Lord. We ask that you can take over our lives and that we can cooperate in this work that you are doing in us. We pray for one another. You know, Lord, that we can sometimes feel alone and very discouraged as we look at ourselves, as our sins, as our fa at our failures. And we can think that others have are so good and wonderful and they don't face the things that we do and that we're so unworthy. But we know, Lord, that each one of us struggles every day with self. So we just pray that we can encourage one another. Uh, we pray for our particular situations, the, the people in our lives who we love and care for, who are struggling and suffering in various ways. And we seek, Lord, to be able to reach them. But we know, Lord, that you have a work to do in us each day. And that that work will be the strongest testimony uh, to those around us. Give us a blessed Sabbath. Uh, bless our time together tomorrow morning. And continue to be with us as we seek your face. May your angels watch over each one. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.